Thanks. I want to thank you for coming today. Um, I wanted to just give a little bit of an overview on what the community transition events are that Sheltering Arms is offering. And the purpose of a community transition event is for us to continue to, to provide resources and patient education on critical diagnoses to support our patients in their healing and recovery after discharge from Sheltering Arms Institute. So each session that we have will have a clinical education presentation, as well as an introduction from one of our community partners uh, who are going to share information on services that may be available to you to help you and support you in your continued recovery. So I have just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the goal is in the future that these events are gonna be held here at Sheltering Arms Institute. But due to all the COVID restrictions, we've had to change these meetings to virtual meetings. And so I know this is new for everyone, so I appreciate your, your efforts in joining us today. So today's topic is lifelong activity after amputation, and it will be led by our physical therapist, Brandon Smith. And then our today's, our community partner is going to be Logan Ann Bruce. And she's an exercise physiologist and the fitness and wellness manager at Sheltering Arms. And she's going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the local services we have here. So if you would please join me in welcoming Brandon and Logan Ann. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Brandon to get started on his presentation. Great. Thank you, Allison. Does everyone hear me okay? How's my volume? Good. Thumbs up. Excellent, let me share my screen here. My name is Brandon Smith and I'm one of the two PT clinical leaders on our multi-specialty unit. Um, just as Allison spoke to, really gonna go over a continuum of care um, for lifelong activity after amputation. Uh, really, according to a report from Healthy People in 2010, about 56% of adults with disabilities don't engage in any leisure time activity um, compared to about 36% of adults without disability. Furthermore, studies suggest that physical activity after amputation oftentimes is really below typical, um, despite the known you know, deleterious effects on overall functioning. Additional literature we have suggests that those with diabetes, especially alongside their amputation, have less physical activity than those without. But of course, you have the power to change that. So objectives here, uh, the three above, as you can see, and you know, think about having finishing up, uh, having finished up your therapy. You may be along the continuum working with outpatient um, or months away from that. Um, what do you do now, right? Remember, we're always on this kind of timeline called life. And as such, we need to always consider what's on the horizon. So our first objective here, what activities are important to age optimally? So let's first define optimal, optimal aging, and look at a key difference amongst typical verbiage. And there's optimal versus successful aging. So optimal aging here really looks at the bold text in spite of one's medical conditions versus successful aging with the definition of absence of disease and disability. So, Looking at the two, right, we oftentimes can't, at this point in time, reverse life and reverse that timeline. We often have medical conditions that we need to, uh, to deal with. That avoiding the disease and, disease and disability is a common criteria with studies of successful aging. However, really recent studies have shown that the absence of disease and disability is not really the most important element in the concept of aging itself. And people with chronic disease can also age successfully, or in other words, we should really say optimally. So this may look familiar 
from our group class, those of you that have been through our group exercise class for patients with amputation, and specifically our exercise class. This is the, a slide from the CDC guidelines uh, for physical activity and exercise for adults as well as older adults. So I want you to think about what you do already within a normal week. What type of activities do you already enjoy in particular? And how can you sort of add more activity within your daily life? I particularly like this slide because at the top it says be active. That is the key. So updated guidelines here that actually came out and were published just a few weeks ago. So if we switch gears from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, instead to the World Health Organization, the WHO, they've now revised their guidelines 10 years later on physical activity and sedentary behavior. And there is a few key differences here to make note. So in particular, instead of looking at 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, or 75 minutes of vigorous intense activity, we're now looking at doing both. You know, they're, they're making our lives harder, right? Ultimately, we've split it up. So they've said that it's no longer an absolute necessity to exercise in bouts of 10 minutes or greater. So everything adds up. And in particular, we oftentimes speak of this with our older adults, 65 and older, that you really want to emphasize balance and strength training uh, to reduce your chance of falling. And of course, somewhat of an obvious one, sedentary behavior should be limited. If we look more closely though at those guidelines, they really did look at research and reviewed activity in individuals with number one, a history of high blood pressure, and two, a history of type two diabetes. And really for those populations, the benefit of doing physical activity and limiting sedentary behavior outweighed the potential harms. Any of those harms and risks though can really be uh, managed by a gradual increase in the amount and intensity of your activity. And of course, some activity is better than none. I will say that repeatedly today. And those that currently don't meet these recommendations can always start with small amounts and gradually increase the frequency or intensity or duration of their activity over time. So with all that being said, the aim is really to decrease the amount of time you spend sedentary or undertake more physical activity, or better yet, a combination of the two. It's important to note as well that time spent sitting in a wheelchair does not really have to be sedentary, right? Some individuals can't avoid prolonged sitting due to their disability. And even if you are, you know, quote unquote wheelchair bound or sitting the majority of the time elsewhere, it's possible to complete activity that doesn't really uh, involve your lower extremities. There are options. So for our older adults, I alluded to basically more activity, better functioning, in particular balance exercises. We all should be working on our balance. Evidence suggests that starts to decline as early as age 30. It's very important. And as we know, fall-related injuries are kind of reduced with that activity. And there is a focus on function. So instead of working simply on sport-specific activity for exercise, as many have done in their uh, younger years. Instead, work on things like standing from a chair. We all, you know, oftentimes have a favorite chair to sit in. You want to be able to do that as you age. So what counts as physical activity? In particular, I think it's important to note that it's things you already have to do or things that don't necessarily have to feel like exercise. Oftentimes we speak of physical activity simply being exercise, but those two don't necessarily go hand in hand. Some individuals don't enjoy exercise and that's perfectly okay. So things like yard work, housework, walking the dog, gardening, things you enjoy, those all count and are very important. Here's a big exhaustive list here. 
I think in particular, some of these may be modder intensity and others would call it vigorous intensity. Some of these activity may not initially be possible at all, unless you consider the ways we could adapt your activity to your ability level. In particular, it's uh, noted in the research that bicycling or cycling, whether uh, using your prosthetic and lower limb, your sound limb, or more often your upper limbs is used most often as exercise in our patients that have had amputations. The next thing it's important to note is that we need to figure out and monitor your intensity level. So something as simple as, uh, let's say, moving around the house lackadaisically is not really going to be intense enough to promote gains in your function. What you can use are a few different methods. Uh, you know, if we get fancy, you can look at heart rate measurement. And note that at a baseline, your heart rate should be around that 60 to 80 beats per minute. And oftentimes, though, that could be affected by your medication. Otherwise, though, heart rate measurement gets kind of uh, complicated, and that's, I think that's something that you'd want to speak to a medical professional or fitness professional to, to monitor appropriately. Instead, let's say you want to do something more uh, simple. So oftentimes, we suggest using what's called a talk test. As it notes there, moderate intensity is if you're really breathing hard, but you can still undertake a conversation. Vigorous intensity, though, you're really struggling to take a breath. And other options include an RPE scale. So both that green and yellow uh, coloring on this scale here really denotes that moderate or vigorous activity. I want you to know as well that that shortness of breath that they denote is not necessarily shortness of breath that's dangerous. I mean, if I walk up the stairs, right, I'm feeling a little short of breath. We know that that will go away. So our next objective looks at really, why do I need to exercise after having an amputation? And of course, we can get to specifics. Oftentimes you'll hear your, your PT in the past speak to improving your range of motion. And that range of motion can affect your ability to use a prosthesis or lay in the bed. Also exercise is help, helping to uh, reduce any swelling, any edema. And really, of course, improve any diabetic compli complications or vascular complications to hopefully reduce any further decline. I think it's important if we talk about why should we exercise, we need to figure out your, your own particular why. We've all heard about the need to stay healthy, especially as you age or in the presence of chronic disease. But I think it's important to look at why and consider quality of life rather than quantity, perhaps. And in turn, how does exercise relate to this? So this is a nice big list here. And ultimately, so many benefits, of course. In particular, oftentimes our patients with amputation have diabetes or and or vascular disease. And they oftentimes hear of the importance of, for example, decreasing their A1C level or that three month level of glucose measurement. Improving blood pressure, healthy weight, cholesterol levels, right? Lower those lipids. Reduce any further progression of cardiovascular disease reduce that risk of falling, contractures, and improve your strength, in particular for prosthetic use. Phantom limb pain or phantom limb sensation is something that can occur briefly or throughout the remainder of your life. It's proven uh, and known that by undergoing greater physical activity, we can reduce those complaints. Ultimately, physical activity is directly related to quality of life, morbidity risk, and longevity. And we can really increase, of course, your physical, excuse me, functional performance through physical activity, thereby improving said quality of life and longevity. Studies show that 
unfortunately, one out of every four individuals have an additional amputation, whether that's higher up on their residual limb or their sound limb. And exercise has been shown to reduce the, uh, the chance of that additional amputation. Unfortunately, um, diabetics especially are known to have a greater risk of additional limb loss. And evidence suggests that, that diabetes limits your walking performance uh, to a greater degree uh, more than any other comorbidity. However, the correlations between physical activity and functional performance suggest that individuals with diabetes actually can improve their function and uh, ultimately improve quality of life and longevity. Long story short, improve that A1C level, right? So here, this is a nice blurry slide. Unfortunately, as I blow it up, I apologize on that. But this kind of looks at taking it all together, right? And this speaks to reducing that chance of type 2 diabetes or complications by up to 40%. I'd say that's, that's huge. That's significant. As we've spoken before, some is good or is better. Every minute counts. And I oftentimes like to tell my patients and those close to me that, you know, it's, it's really never too late. So now that we've discussed the why and the what, let's really chat about how and in particular, uh, how to navigate various obstacles to starting a routine, as well as actionable resources to take advantage of. These obstacles I speak to have really been shown to uh, center around motivational issues, knowledge gaps, and even television watching. Financial barriers, of course, and uh, little or lack of family members and social support. Additional obstacles, in particular for those that have had an amputation, involved prosthetic socket issues that affect fit and stability. And these have been shown to promote acceptance and kind of self-efficacy to, to really desire to exercise. If you look at these opportunities versus the barriers, I think it's important to start to think within yourself, how much activity do I really complete on the regular? Take a log or you know, write it down get a baseline. And you may actually undergo greater physical activity than you think. And this is where some of that technology can come in to help you monitor and make things easier from logging things on your cell phone to smartwatches and the like. And that last uh, sentence there, you know, I think in rehab, we tend to use a term called saliency. In other words, suggesting activity by def definition that stands out from the rest in order to maximize attention and participation uh, to facilitate learning. So consider what's salient to you. What physical activity will help you best carry out the task uh, when the going gets tough? What activity helps keep you motivated? So speaking of when the going gets tough, right? It's very important to have support. And one of those, uh, one of the largest barriers to physical activity completion in those that have had amputations per the science has really said lack of social support. And also look at what's available in the community, right? set up a uh, contacts with others and walking groups um, to really provide friendship support and have a buddy, right? Keep you accountable. So key reminders here, you should always start with getting permission from your physician. And of course, you may have a lot of physicians that you go and see. Uh, in a perfect world, you would communicate with each and every one of them, right? At the very least, I would suggest to contact your primary care physician to ensure that they're aware of your efforts. The second bullet there, it's very important to begin exercise slowly. You may remember from your time in rehab or physical therapy that you were probably sore for a few days. And 
that delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS as we call it as an acronym is, is actually okay. However, there's ways to avoid it. Go slowly, essentially. Now, what happens is, is we often see that that soreness kind of reduces that motivation. So again, begin slowly based on your current fitness level. And third bullet, intensity. So easy does not mean necessarily uh, intense and vice versa. You can take breaks, you can split things up. As we said, nowadays, the literature suggests that as long as you complete that activity in total, you don't necessarily need to do it in 10 minute bouts or greater. Setting goals. So I like to think of a recent commercial I saw on TV that uh, has an older adult in particular, and he is, uh, has, it's showing him uh, starting to lift more and more weight over time. Um, and you notice that the time changes, there starts to be snow on the ground and there's Christmas decorations up. The end of the commercial uh, shows that individual lifting up his grandchild to place the tree topper uh, on the Christmas tree. So in turn, that individual had been preparing for that moment for months and months. So that's their goal, that was their goal, right? And that really uh, shows benefit to say, think about what's important to you. Maybe it is your grandchild. Maybe it is um, just getting out more, uh, more often. It's very important to have that goal to improve your motivation. Now, modifying activities. This one's difficult at times. One of those barriers we've seen is the inability, uh, whether that's knowledge or really the environment that you're exercising in to modify that activity. And I think it's where it would be important to either contact your therapist, uh, fitness professional, or you know, in turn seek help. There is likely a way to modify things. Every minute counts. And peer and social support has really been shown to uh, be very important to sticking to uh, two things in the long run. Other resources in the community here, right? There's always this thought of, do you need to have an outpatient physical therapy tune-up is what we call it. Perhaps once you're finished with your, your PT, you consider going back at some sort of interval. And I would just certainly discuss that with your outpatient therapist, whether currently or in the past. Tune-ups are okay, tune-ups happen. Now, there's lots of other activities though and resources available in the community. So let's take a look at those. So if you look at more of a higher level resource, uh, and this by no means is an exhaustive list, but the first one there is the Move Your Way Activity Planner, and that's by the Department of Health and Human Services. So this planner is online, and it is a kind of way to set goals and easily choose activities amongst a list that you plan to do. And I think it somewhat helps with that motivation. Um, you can print your plan out, you can track yourself through the week and check the box. Right? The Top right uh, logo there is from the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability, which is a public health practice and resource center on really health promotion for people with disabilities. Um, this in particular program, they call it a 14 week program to a healthier you, uh, is a free personalized web based program that targets people with any mobility limitation. And the goal is to get people moving. The goal is to make healthy nutrition choices as well. And that's 14 weeks in length uh, and has really been shown to be helpful to, again, maintain motivation and attain those goals. The National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability also has a uh, How I Walk campaign. That's effort, uh, an effort to refer reframe uh, walking as an inclusive activity. That last logo there, Active People Healthy Nation, that's a national movement led by the CDC um, that provides really a comprehensive approach to improving physical activity, whether via individuals, uh, communities, and organizations, and kind of have champions to champion activity. So 
Some more familiar resources that you've seen likely throughout your stay at Shelter Arms Institute or additional activities include the Amputee Coalition. So Shelter Arms Institute is fortunate enough to have a hospital partnership with the Amputee Coalition. And there's really a myriad of resources on uh, limb loss online. And of course, uh, your, your peer mentor resources there as well. Sportable is also another hospital partner who really provides uh, both competitive and recreational uh, adaptive sports programming. The Virginia Navigator program is uh, helpful to really look online and seek out any resources uh, for a, a good amount of individuals and Shelter Your Arms Institute in particular has the No Wrong Doors program initiative to help navigate those waters. Mission Gate in particular is a local organization that looks at um, helping those with amputation continue to stay active and whether therapy or their what's called discover your possible events um, really help attain that goal. The discover your possible events unfortunately this year was online and that is available uh, with a quick Google search. I would encourage you to, to seek that out. It is free and available. But typically those discover your possible events uh, are really a one day skills workshop for patients with amputation of any level where local vendors and organizations get together to review opportunities here in the local Richmond area. And what I'll do now is turn our screen over to uh, Logan Ann, who is the manager of our health and, well health and wellness services over at Sheltering Arms. And Logan, if you want me to, I'll just uh, advance the slide for you. That's perfect. Thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Brandon Allison said, my name is Logan Ann. I am a certified exercise physiologist, and I'm the health and wellness manager at Sheltering Arms. I'm excited to tell you guys a little bit about the opportunities we offer um, and how we're kind of different from other things you may have seen in the community. Um, before I talk about what we do offer, I want to talk about how um, really my team is unique in what we do. Um, so I, I a lot of times hear from uh, prospective clients and members that sometimes they have a lot of hesitation uh, with working with a personal trainer. Um, <clears throat> for example, will this person understand, you know, my amputation, will they understand things like um, skin checks, you know, what my ability level is, things um, to really focus on, contraindications. Um, that's something very unique to our team. So we are actually a certified exercise physiologist. And a quick recap of what that is. Um, the majority of my team, we have a bachelor or master's degree in exercise science and physiology. So we've got a really good look um, and how the body performs under exercise, particularly those with any form of um, disability or condition. Um, in addition to that, our, our team has hours of training um, and quite a different skill set than you may see in other uh, places in the community. Um, so with that, um, we also have a very close relationship with physical therapists, both internal and external, and that includes physicians. So you'll find with their team a very uh, little disconnect between what you've been doing with therapy or what your physician has prescribed and what we're able to do and kind of carry over with you. Um, so there's a little bit more level of confidence with our team that we really want you to know that, um, you know, we want to be able to take you to the next level. We understand where you're currently at. Um, we understand your condition and your needs, and we're going to support you. Um, that's really why we're called Partners for Life. So a couple of things that... Uh, we offer, which is a variety of different things. Um, the first one is membership. Okay, so if you're uh, pretty independent, you know what to do. Um, but again, kind of like Brandon was alluding to, you want to be in an environment with um, like-minded people. Um, we offer various pool and fitness center, center memberships. Um, we have locations around the Richmond metro area, particularly in Midlothian, um, Henrico County, and Mechanicsville that we offer membership services at. Um, apart from just um, your regular pool and fitness center memberships, we are also partners with Silver Sneakers, uh, Silver and Fit, and Renew Active. Um, so if you check your insurance card, um, you may be eligible for some of those programs, which provide you a year membership to our facility that your insurance actually covers for you. 
Um, the one nice thing is they're a little bit different, so you won't just come in, sign your liability paperwork, and go on to working out. Um, we do do a full orientation with you, go through your medical history, and make sure you're safe. Um, we also offer other programs, so we think you'd be a great candidate for, for, for that and would benefit from it. Um, then we'll certainly recommend that at the time. Uh, same thing, we give you a full tour of our facility and also um, really an idea of how to use all of our equipment safely. And these will be the same faces that you'll see day in and day out. So it's a very uh, tight niche community for sure. Um, if you're looking for something with a little bit more guidance, uh, maybe you're new to exercise, you're not exactly sure where to start or what really is best for your needs, we offer uh, adaptive exercise training. So we've got a couple of options for those. We have a uh, one hour session or a 30 minute session. And again, we can do those both land or in pool. Um, these are all led by our certified exercise physiologist. We offer a complimentary consult ahead of time so we can go through your medical history, uh, go through your goals, communicate with your physical therapist, physician at that time to make sure we're all on the same page and really set you up a successful program. And then your first session in, we'll kind of get right into it. We offer a really big holistic approach to exercise. So Brandon talked an awful lot about the importance of nutrition, not only ways to be active in the gym, but ways to be active outside of a gym. Um, also really those social components that really help motivate you and um, really are gonna allow you to be more active. So we really focus on not just the strength conditioning portion of that, um, but really a holistic approach to make sure that you stay committed to exercise because again, it's not episodic, it's a lifestyle. Um, and as we all can kind of probably allude to in the uh, experience, uh, you don't lose it, or sorry, you don't use it, you lose it. So that's really where we want to make sure that you kind of continue that journey um, for being physically active. Um, and right now, particularly given the times, if you're like, hey, you know, I'm really not comfortable going to a facility, um, we do offer virtual options. Um, those are very successful. We can show you how to create a really safe home environment where you can also be physically active in. And you wouldn't believe the things that are actually um, right in reaching distance that you can use that kind of um, really equate to weights you would find at a fitness center. And Brandon, if you could flip to the next screen, please. Awesome. Okay. Uh, one of our other big programs that we offer is the PowerX program. Um, so for a lot of people, I'm sure at some point you've joined a club or you've joined a fitness facility. Again, you've signed all your paperwork, you're ready to work out, and then you go, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. So this is really a program that we created to bridge that gap. Um, our goal was to get you to exercise independently. Um, and we do this by offering the PowerX program, which gives you a three-month membership to our fitness center and our pool. On top of that, depending on what program that you go with, you get six to 12 half hour sessions with an exercise physiologist. Uh, we're going to design you an exercise program. So we're taking out all the guesswork, you'll know exactly what to do and follow. And we really progress your workout and also educate you. So when you finish that three month program, whether you join us as a member or whether you go to another health club or fitness facility, you feel comfortable knowing here's a safe way to exercise, here are the proper techniques, because like Brandon said, in intensity, weight, it all matters. Um, so we really instruct and teach you how to properly do all that. And then as you graduate uh, from our program, we're hoping, and that's really the goal, to make sure that you're independent with exercise. And again, it's not just episodic, it's a lifestyle at that point. Um, so again, we've got um, PowerX Standard, which again gives you the six half hour sessions. Uh, for both programs, I know sometimes motivation is challenging, so we do kind of add a little attendance requirement. Um, working towards those goals, like Brandon said, being physically active, you know, three to five days a week, we at least have a minimum of two days a week, and we really try to work you up to meeting those ACSM guidelines of physical activity. Um, PowerX Elite, we offer a little bit more because we have more time with you. Instead of six sessions, we have 12. And from there, you're really able to work with your exercise physiologist. And if during some of those sessions you don't need your program rewrote, we can focus on things like nutrition. Uh, we can also focus on aspects like balance, um, core stability, a lot of different things. Again, we really take that holistic approach. So there's more opportunities to review a little bit more uh, with you in PowerX Elite. 
Um, in addition, if you have a caregiver who is willing to come with you, wants to, you know, exercise with you, you know, really help to make sure um, both you and your caregiver are active, uh, PowerX Elite is another great program for that. And I have a link at the bottom of the screen here. Um, we've got some great videos to really show the PowerX program. Um, a lot of great videos from our uh, PowerX lead, also many exercise physiologists showing uh, really what we do and how we're different. So please feel free to take a look at those. Awesome, great. Okay. So I guess at this time, um, does anyone have any questions for myself, Brandon, or Allison? So okay. I think that's a great point. You you spoke to having difficulty with your, your prosthetic fit, which that science really suggests is a barrier to walking. So I would suggest, as you've said, to utilize resistive bands, any cardio equipment you have within the home. And luckily this time you're going through that outpatient physical therapy. So at your, your, your next treatment session or so, I would discuss with your therapist, what exactly can I do with the equipment I have? How often do I need to do it? And they'll help you through that process. So you mentioned the need to do, use resistance stretch bands several times a day. I'd say more than likely, yes. Um, at this time, it would be a great idea uh, to discuss the intensity and frequency of completing those exercises with your outpatient PT. I wanted to wrap things up today and um, I thank you all, both uh, Brandon and Logan Ann for your time today. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Um, we will be having our next community transition event for individuals with the amputation in March of 2021. So I will have you on our email list to reconnect now that um, the, the Zoom is the way to go for a little while. I hopefully at some point we'll be able to bring everybody <coughs> back into Sheltering Arms Institute for these events. But until then, we want to stay connected with you. So stay tuned for some additional um, educational information in 2021.